Okay, so let's get down to another video. I hope the sound comes out okay this time. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, a couple months ago I did a video uh, which was unboxing a package from Diabolic DVD. Uh, and it contained uh, Ernesto Vistaldi's libido and Eloy De La Iglesia's No One Heard the Scream, both on Blu-ray. Very exciting, very exciting package. Uh, that video went on to get 55,000 uh, views as of now. I wish it had 55,000 likes. Uh, it's had almost 50 likes, but based on the ratios as I'm reading them, it has over 50 dislikes. But I guess that's what happens when you get over 50,000, you know. You could get lots of gr gr likes and lots of dislikes. Uh, so please put a like on this video. Um, it helped me tremendously uh, to fight the tide of the algorithms. The videos of mine that are doing the best are the ones uh, about topics that, you know, well, in this, on this particular show, Blue Review, about films that are not being covered much elsewhere on YouTube. So that's been a plus for me. I, I just worked out that way. Um, so that may be part of why that one took off. I don't know. Um, I started changing my graphic style after that, and that's helped some of my videos. And then some of my videos, I think people are like, whatever, you know, flat, you know tossing a few pictures together. It looks silly. But I'm an artist, and I like collage, but I'm no master of collage. So what I try to do is do a kind of an impressionistic piece that will be like some of my favorite scenes or takes, shots, images uh, from what I'm covering. Uh, or some interesting, uh, or some interesting uh, posters. Like I do a crying game, I did a row of, uh, of more rarer posters for the movie since everyone knows the main poster. Um, so, this video will be fun to do. I haven't done the thumbnail yet. So uh, what I'll be doing in this video is, uh, as I did with libido later after that uh, very successful video, uh, I did a video solely de devoted to libido. Um, and I got about 5,000 views and, uh, and a fair amount of likes. And I was really happy with the way that both of those came out. So what took me so damn long to do, no one heard the scream. Because after all, I ha had the film on VHS years ago. I reviewed it for Shock Cinema. Uh, and it was published and distributed nationally. Maybe 10 people read it, but a lot of copies got out there. Uh, still no one cared about Eloy de la Iglesia. Um, you know, Anchor Bay released Cannibal Man on DVD. That was a very big deal in the early 2000s. Uh, other than that, you couldn't get any of his stuff. Um, I got a bootleg from a place called iOffer.com. Had some great success with that site. I had, I was ripped off horribly too in the end. I guess they folded. Um, you know, they're, they're an untrust, they were an untrustworthy site. I mean, they were all bootlegs and sometimes you got something really rare. Sometimes you got something you could have gotten elsewhere officially for the same price, but you know, I didn't always research as carefully as I do now. Anyway, rarelust.com, I believe, had a print, so I upgraded it in the glass ceiling, which I also covered on this channel, also by Eloy de la Iglesia. And I'll be mentioning that one a couple of times during this review. Uh, I got an upgrade of both of them. I forgot his source. It may have been a foreign DVD. It may have been a foreign Blu-ray, but... Uh, so I've seen the movie several times, and subsequent to all this, uh, Severin Films, uh, you know, who, whose owner, David Gregory, was involved in the uh, Anchor Bay Cannibal Man release, um, he released a slate of Eloy de la Iglesia. He released Cannibal Man, he, he released No One Heard the Scream, uh, he released uh, Clockwork Terror, uh, otherwise known as Murder in a Blue World, which I've also reviewed on this channel. Um, and that was another fairly well-received video, uh, so to my surprise. And a friend of mine did the liner notes. That was cool. Um, and then he also released uh, Navajeros, a kind of a boy gang movie, 
which I have started watching on Shutter, but to be honest, I have not finished it yet. But I like it so far. And then there's these ones called Kinky. I'm just pronouncing it that way. It's Q-U-I-N-Q-U-I, so I'm just going to take Kinky. One and two. Uh, and apparently, I think there is a box set that's got Kinky one and two and Nava Heroes. So I'm going to watch all of these on Shudder. They're all on Shudder. Uh, Murder in Blue World is not on Shudder, but all of the Severin D. Like Lazia titles you can watch on Shudder if you subscribe to Shudder. Um, and um, actually, I kept... Uh, watching uh parts of the no one heard the scream blu-ray on my large tv in the living room but i've been shuttling all around upstairs and downstairs between computers and for various reasons mainly because all of my technology is gradually failing so some things can do what other things cannot and vice versa and also i have no central air in my house i have no cold air blowing in uh you know and it's uh, deep south. So my Freon ran out and my ancient machine is, is read this last and I can't afford to get it. I could, I could buy another pound of Freon and make it through the next year, but then that'd be it. Then I have to buy a new machine. So I really have to buy a new machine, a new Freon, however you cut it. Maybe I can do that next year, maybe I can't. But anyway, so I wrote off this year and I bought some extra fans and I'm just suffering because I'm extremely um, sensitive to heat and uh, direct light. Uh, part of it's natural, part of it's some of the medications I'm on. And it only gets worse as I get older. So that's one reason I'm kind of a vampiric, hermetic shut-in. But I get to talk to you guys on the internet. So you guys can benefit from my strange lifestyle, hopefully. Um, so let's talk about No One Heard the Scream. I was talking about watching on my big TV, and finally I just, I was like, I need to finish watching the end, because as many times as I've seen it, I forgot the twist, you know, and that's key to a giallo. This is a Spanish giallo. We'll talk about Spanish giallos in a minute. Um, so I watched it on Shudder on my other computer to the end. I actually part of it on my phone on Shudder. Don't tell David Lynch, okay, that I watched a movie on the phone. I do that sometimes now. Um, it's for expediency only. Um, and the twist, I started to guess it. And then I was like, oh, is that? And it was. But I, did I remember it or did I just guess it? I can't, I'm not sure how, how it worked, how my brain processed the information it was getting. But I was finally starting to pick up some clues. And I was like, it's probably going to be this. And it was that. Um, but I don't concretely remember watching that ending exactly. Some images of it. Uh, Dean Laglaze is fantastic with images, uh, with cutting, uh, with sound, um, and atmosphere. I'm going to be right back. I want to uh, grab something to help me out here, and I'll be with you. Okay, so let's get the show on the road. Um, here, I'm back on the road. Uh, here is No One Heard the Scream, uh, the Severin Blu-ray. Um, and there's the back. And there is the inside with that book. Oh, it doesn't have a booklet. Um, but anyway, I'm glad this thing exists. It makes me happy. Um, now, I wanted to tell you, I never pronounced this correctly. The Spanish name of the movie is Nadi Oyo Gritar. Uh, which I don't know if it directly translates as no one heard the scream, but there's no evidence that it doesn't. I guess people who are fluent in Spanish uh, would know. Um, so yeah, it's a 1973 Spanish film, and it is a Spanish giallo. Um, and like I said, I've talked about De La Glazy a lot on this channel. He's been very forgotten in genre film history, and this is the time with the format of Blu-ray and the widespread dissemination of information on the internet. It's not like a few of us writing these reviews and shock cinema getting hard copies in bookstores and hoping someone might read it. Then what do they do? If they're lucky, they buy an expensive bootleg on VHS that looks kind of crummy, but hey, at least they've experienced a taste of what the film is. And that was what 1990s 
uh, genre a cult film video collecting was like and viewing was like you know other than watching you know uh, stuff rented from the mom and pop stores uh, and of course for occasionally from cockbusters I'm sorry I cannot stop calling them that and I I won't stop calling them that um, no one heard the scream uh, you know what I like about it is it has the same atmosphere of Cannibal Man. And let me throw in a very quick anecdote about Cannibal Man. The Cannibal Man that Severin has released on Blu-ray, which I do not own as of yet, I don't know if I'll get it, is completely uncut. The print that was used in the Anchor Bay DVD in the 2000s was lacking a couple of minutes. And, you know, of course they didn't say it was, I mean, they said it was uncut, uncensored for the first time in America on home video. That, everything about that was true, except for the uncut, uncensored, but I think it was uh, a, a matter possibly of the elements being lost, or possibly even Anchor Bay didn't know about the other uh, few minutes. It's not very long stuff. It's not any key you know, gore shots or anything. Uh, it is rather gory. Um, what I did was uh, a few years ago when Code Red released it under the name The Apartment on the 13th Floor, um, he had a truly uncut print, and that's what I have. And it looks beautiful. And um, I, I thought about reviewing it on his, and I'm like, now there's the competing versions. So who knows? Maybe I'll just talk about the movie for a Halloween special this or next year, but... Uh, because I really love the movie, but the, the Severn version now, I'm sure, is definitive. It includes that footage that William Olson and Code Red managed to reinsert to the movie seamlessly. He did a great job. And uh, David, uh, David Gregory and company have done, I'm sure, a fantastic job. I have yet to see that print. However, that print is on Shutter, So I suppose I'll watch it on there and I'll compare. Um, so anyway... Uh, his work is like very often slow and deliberate. Uh, his cutting is weird. He'll do a lot of cuts that will be uh, flash forwards and sometimes flashbacks, flash forwards. Flash forwards are very interesting, and a lot of times they're very symbolic of something he he's building to. Uh, and that's especially true in this film. In this film, uh, basically you have Carmen Sevilla, his favorite actress who did an incredible performance in the glass ceiling is this very, very vulnerable character. Uh, I did a review of that one. I hope you'll watch it. I can't remember what blue review episode it was, um, but it was one of the extreme slash forgotten because it was the only key one that Severn didn't put out. And I'm hoping they will, they will in time. Anyway, Carmen Seville plays a totally different character in this movie. She's, she's playing a woman who's, uh, I don't know the age of the actress at the time. I haven't researched her extensively. Uh, but one source said, supposedly in her late 30s, because there is an exchange in the film about youth um, and growing older between two characters. Uh, but anyway, she's in her late 30s. She's still a beautiful woman. She has a very um, fancy lifestyle. Basically, she lives in the penthouse of a uh, building, a uh, tall apartment building uh, in Madrid. And... She's kind of a kept woman of various older men, especially a guy named Oscar who travels a lot. So these old guys, you know, kind of keep her put up in that style she's accustomed to and fly in once in a while or occasionally fly them out to places like London that they mention and presumably have sex. And, you know, uh, it makes the old guys, you know, feel young to have, you know, an arm charm, so to speak, <laughs> some say, on, you know, of Carmen Sevilla uh, by his side. So uh, she's a little haughty, a little arrogant. Um, not as much as I tended to remember. I was pretty hard on the character from what I remember, what I wrote in Shock Cinema you know, 20 odd years ago. Um, but I think it was just the contrast between Elisa, this character, and the character she played in Glass Ceiling. Uh, but that to me shows her versatility, and I really like would like to see more of her films. And if she was in her late thirties and the early seventies, I'd like to see stuff what she did in the sixties when she was in her twenties and was a, a you know a younger beauty. Uh, 
but in any case, uh, this kind of penthouse deal is mostly offices on a tower block. And there's one other guy who lives there. He's not nearly as well off, but he's, you know, I guess he's doing okay. Um, and uh, this cat's named Miguel. So Miguel has, has a wife, Nuria, Nuria uh, and you don't really know all this at first. You really, it's all focused on her. The beginning of the movie is fantastic. It's just really stylish and almost kitschy. It shows tons, it's like, the, it's like my thumbnails that I do for these videos, except in black and white, like tons of shots of them all through the movie. So you're already flash forwarding and trying to think, well, what happened there and what happened there and you know the overwhelming feeling you get with the music which is really breezy and kind of upbeat is that uh vincent pa vincent para the co-star miguel and elisa are going to have some affair possibly unconventional and weird but they're eventually going to fall into a romance so they kind of telegraph what it's what it's about like he's you know something's gone wrong and then they have an affair and then blah 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 um you know, very simple, uh, but the music's fantastic. The credits are, the credit logos are great, uh, fonts are great. It's just very evocative of that time, 1973, when probably thousands of incredible works of art in film, books, comic books, music, uh, sculpture, uh, you know, theater, all were uh, unleashed on the world. It was such a time and I, I hate that I was so so young that I couldn't really be involved in it but I did I, I did look at pictures in comic books I could not read yet uh, and I did watch a lot of TV so luckily my mom was a TV and uh, movie buff and both of my parents were very well read so I had kind of a taste of it but I didn't know all about the counterculture and all the foreign stuff, and you know. And now I'm like, wow, okay, what a time to live. So, especially if you've had access to this kind of thing. I, I wonder if no one heard the scream even played in America. I, I should, I should research that. Um, but getting back to the point, the beginning's beautiful, and then uh, the music continues to be really amazing. And uh, I wanted to credit this guy because I like to credit people. Uh, I did this last time with an artist, uh, like Fernando Garcia Morchillo. I know nothing about him. There's no external links to him on Wikipedia. But man, he does it all in this one. So he's got this kind of cocktail, you know, kind of uh, music. Uh, it'd be very appropriate on those incredibly strange music type comps that were put out in the uh, 90s, inspired by the book Incredibly Strange Music. Uh, you know, you had the cocktail and space age and bachelor pad stuff. And this is part of Italian. This music is kind of an echo of Italian beat music, which was used in the soundtracks all through, uh, the soundtracks of all these films, especially genre films. And, you know, the beat music kind of combined like that kind of cocktail, kind of easy listening, uh, kitschy. But then it would go into prog rock, and then it would go into heavy metal lit, some orchestration, crazily some over the top romantic vocals, sometimes in English, sometimes in Spanish, Italian. And it's its own thing. And that also became a series of uh, DVDs called Beat at Chinachita, uh, which were incredible. They gave, basically were mainly cuts from the soundtracks of Italian genre films, mainly uh, Jallos. Uh, and so you had a whole stew of these guys. We've talked about this before, and I know you guys know a lot about this, I'm sure. And Neil Morcone, he was at the head of the pack, but you had like Francesco De Masi, you had Louis Bakalov, um, you had uh, Stelvio Cipriani. Oh my God, he's incredible. You had Goblin, kind of exploded into things with, with Deep Red and, and brought more of a metal edge to it. Um, and there's a few other incredible composers, uh, Bruno Nicolai, uh, Carlo Rostichelli, who did a lot of Bava. Um, it's it's amazing, so, and and it is like the title of my you know uh, aborted for now music show on here. It's like a bottomless well. 
all of this stuff is. So it's nice to be able to have some of it surface. God knows what. Seventy three. So forty nine years later, I'm talking about this movie. So Vincent Para starred in Cannibal Man, by the way. Uh, he plays a very different kind of character too. He has a sinister or leery kind of creepy edge to him in both roles, but Cannibal Man is like he's full goes full sociopath, even though there is a human and humane part in him, and a lot of his problems are the result of class struggle. Um, these films have a lot of political subtext. A lot of Spanish genre films during this period did, because these cats were very unhappy with this Francisco, Generalissimo Francisco Franco cat. And, and no one hated Francisco Franco more than Jesus Franco, the filmmaker. Uh, this movie allegedly was cut and censored. I have no idea why, because it has some pretty controversial and grisly shots, but it has no extended sex and violence. I'm sorry to disappoint you if that's what you're expecting. Uh, it's mostly tension and mind games and beautiful atmosphere. So back to the beginning, and uh, Elisa strolling through Madrid, and this, this easy listening music becomes this incredible, like, heavy prog rock riff, and it's just, the fuzz on the guitar is just, like, frying your brain and she's like walking on these impossibly high platform shoes. And it's just so of its era, you get like enveloped, it's like a time warp. And that's one thing, one reason I love watching these kind of films. Um, but anyway, you after the setup of her and at the, at the penthouse and then her, uh, one of the attendants who's this, you know, they've got to have kind of an eccentric comic relief character. He's not in it much, but eccentric older guy he's bald and he's well-mannered but kind of pearl clutching guy you know somebody you would see definitely in an argento film or a martino film you know as a little kind of distraction and the plot maybe even a red herring but he doesn't really have any function other than to drive basic exposition you know when he appears which is only two or three times so that's good you know they've got him in place he's doing his thing and because there aren't many characters in this movie it's mainly uh, Elisa and Miguel. It's mainly their story. Uh, and, and, of course, to an extent, uh, Nuria, or Nuria. I don't know how to pronounce her name. It's, they say Nuria, but I, I can't do the rolled R's as well as Spanish people. But I think it's Nuria. We're going to see that. I have a character named Nuria, Naya Nuria, uh, <laughs> that I made up years ago. And to be honest, I'm pretty sure I got the name Nuria from this film and just had forgotten about it. So, uh, Nuria and Miguel don't have a happy marriage. Uh, and she's, according to him, a horrible, dominating, emasculating, objectifying, uh, you know, slattern, virago kind of character. I'm not trying to sound sexist, that's just how what's evo evoked of her is like this horrible, cruel, feminine archetype. So, but basically, you see her at first, you did believe you see him dropping her into an elevator shaft. Not only do we see her, but so does Elisa. So this is the whole, you know, uh, what's the word, uh, linchpin around which the plot revolves. And you're like, why the fuck did it take 20 minutes to get to that premise? Um, because I don't like to rush. You've heard me when I rush and I, I sound very anxious and just completely like I'm going to hyperventilate or something. I'm a little more relaxed tonight. So, uh, of course, he starts to, like, stalk her. He's got a gun, and he's like, you know, let me in. I have to talk to you. I have to see you. Because he drops the body in the elevator shaft. And he's like, I've got to recover the body. It's, it's my wife. And she's like, oh, my God. So you see another side of Elisa that she's she's not she's not some cold-hearted, out-of-touch bourgeoisie. I mean, you know, she's she's shocked by murder, especially murdering one's spouse. Um, and her character softens gradually along these lines throughout this kind of journey she takes with Miguel through the film in this caper that he's gotten her mixed up in because she witnessed him disposing of his wife's body 
And so they go down, and he has to clean up the elevator shaft and wipe lots of blood off the wall. There, there is quite a bit of blood in this movie, I'll say that. And there's a little tiny bit of entrail that he wipes off, too. And she's like, Ugh. and I wonder if that was one of the shots that Franco said, that must go. And um, after the cleanup, they get involved in this kind of absurdist, almost Benwellian uh, set of circumstances, misadventures. <laughs> they put her in the trunk wrapped up in this rug and sure enough for some reason they reach this toll and these cops are there and they're like there's been an accident and people are hurt can you help transport some of the injured people and so he has to make room he has to bring these two bloody people again lots of blood there's like the woman is just like kind of laying there and uh looking half dead and uh he has to take something out of this back to accommodate them so you know the trunk here is in the front of the car and you know in this in in that kind of make a model kind of car in that country at that period or as the brits say the boot uh so in the boot of the car the the uh the body's there so he has to put the suitcase on top of it and he keeps pushing it down and it's getting a little tense and the cops are like Maybe we could take out and should take out what's in there, or maybe we, should, you know, it's all like just right on the edge. You know, they barely believe him, and but he kind of has this suave charm, and they'll play things off with a quip or two. And she rushes in to lie for him and with him. She's his wife, and yeah, it is rough. They got to, you know, they can't take that thing out. They're, and he finally it clamps, and then, you know, they're still a little, you know giving him the side eye for a while so uh they they ferry these two wounded people to the hospital later we find out that the woman was already dead maybe not when she first got in the car but the shots where she's like this she was our, she was indeed dead they just didn't state it um and that reminds me of the flash forwards so there are a couple of flash forwards that happen from the time of the elevator shaft incident all throughout the film that, that gather momentum one is a, I'm not sure what it looks It looks like a little leg of a fancy chair or a mace. I mean, it's very, you know, it's definitely super hard wood and this kind of leaf uh, design. And, you know, you can hit someone over the head with the, the butt of that and, and not the butt of it, but the, that very florid end and crack their head open. And that apparently is what happened. So you just see it in frame and somebody's holding it but you don't see their hand and it's covered with blood and then you flash sometimes to a woman looking up like this and her face is covered in blood and you see like maybe a brain is sticking out and these are like quick shots and sometimes they appear at bizarre times i think he's trying to create this psychological underpinning to like what a what miguel is flashing back on haunted by and of course, what, yeah, well, he, well, at least I didn't see it, but what he saw uh, and experienced. Uh, and also, it points to what really happened. I mean, really happened. And herein lies the ever famous Jalo twist. So, after they get through all of this, they're hanging out at her place, they're back in the building. He's like, I guess I'll go back home. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know. Uh, he comes to visit her the next day, and suddenly he is like wooing her. And at first, she's like, "What the hell?" And she had been softening toward him. She even tried to kill him at one time. She knocked him off this boat when they disposed of the body. Was, you know, and it went around and around in the speedboat, a la Jennifer Hills in in, in uh, "I Spit on Your Grave," uh, but with no axe uh, and, and no, you know. Pay a suck it, bitch, or whatever she says to the guy on the back. Um, just before her, the motor turns his head into, you know, nothingness. So that's one I'd like to have on Blu-ray. If anyone like wants to sponsor this channel and, and provide me with the, the, the current Blu-ray edition of I, I Spill in Your Grave, then you'd be a permanent channel Patreon sponsor and forever in my debt and a part of this, this project. That's slowly growing so if not that's cool i mean we're all broke right now um 
Yeah, she even tried to kind of tried to kill him once, but then she had a change of heart. So at this juncture, you know, towards the end of the second act, or you could say the beginning of the third act, I guess, might be more accurate in its pacing, is that she um she just she agrees to go on a date with him. Uh and again, there's all kinds of really kind of slow, deliberate conversations, a lot of cuts to like their eyes and like <laughs> scene shot through their wine glass you know one of them's holding a wine glass and looking at the other and you're seeing what she sees through the wine glass almost like Jess Franco uh, does at times um but I like these touches they're a little disorienting they're a little artsy maybe too artsy for some people but I don't think they take you out of the movie I think to me they make you more unnerved like like what do these two characters really think of each other you know, what is the real deal? And there's this dance they're doing the whole film. So, yes, they end up making love and frolicking. And, and she has this giant bathtub with this round bathtub in the middle of this giant room, and they have a bubble bath and frolic. And the music gets that kind of gay, I mean old school meaning of gay, merry kind of, you know, uh, a cocktail hour, you know, um, that vibe. And uh, so that's not a good sign. You get a movie like this and you're at the next to the last set of scenes and they're in a bubble bath and they're in there for like three or four solid minutes. and They're just frolicking and that music is going on and you're like, okay, so I'm in another movie now. This could be the ending, right? Of course not. So... If you make it through the bubble bath scene, it's really not as it's really not tedious. It's just the, the music pushes it along, and it's his his cutting, which is great. I don't know who the editor of this movie is. Should I find out? Because I like sharing info with you guys. Uh, edited by Antonio Ramirez de Loyosa, and I gotta say, old Antonio, man, he he is great at realizing Eloy's kind of fractured vision, uh, the way he sets up and does this kind of cut. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I can explain some of this technically about editing, but I don't want to go into a laborious tangent. And then some of it, I'm I'm not going to be 100% correct about what, how I describe it. I don't want to sound like a, a kind of a, a you know a dilettante or something. So you guys who are editors or know about editing, old school editing, you know, on the, on the whatever you call them, you know, by hand with the cutting. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> after the bubble bath, uh, she has been taking sleeping pills through the movie. A lot of the things that happen in the toward the very end are set up all the way in the beginning of the movie, which of course is something writers always have to keep in mind in movies, especially ones where there's a mystery. Gastaldi has talked about this at length before. Um, he's talked about it at length even on my uh, Facebook film group, Deep Images, in, a, in posts, and I'm really proud and honored to, to, uh, to host those kind of things. Um, but, you know, uh, he's kind of the expert on gel of writing, and um, he kind of refined it into an art, almost single-handedly, really. Um, and, you know, basically... All the shots and hints and things, in his mind, should count toward the end. So that's what in literature some people call a unity of effect, where everything is relevant, everything is driving you toward the ultimate, the climax, the, the, the twist, the, the donument. And um, some people use the unity of effect and some people don't. Uh, as a writer, I personally do not. But then I write long form fiction uh, and long arcs. So uh, more and more that style is not. And, and of course, with so many movies nowadays being postmodern and, and post Tarantino and ironic and where you have a lot of asides and people talking about pop culture and, you know, tangents. I mean, you know, the first movie I ever saw really like that was Slacker by Richard Linklater. It, it was nothing but tangents. But it was realistic, and it was entertaining. I knew people like some of those people. They, they were in Austin, and I was in Charlotte. 
Um, so I think, uh, but in a thriller, thrillers aren't always as careful. The jallos are a different thing. That's part really of what makes a jallo a jallo. Not always, but generally there's a horrible secret or a terrible thing that has happened or is going to happen or happen in someone's past, the trauma, trauma being a big part of these movies. Uh, and you're moving ever, ever toward what it is. You know, what is, what's killing all these people? Why are they all being killed? Why is this being killing them? Is this being a male, a female, or both? You know, and, and that's the thing. I mean, uh, so there's not a lot of room for fat, like Roger Corman would say, you have to show, you know, have it shorn off. Uh, it has to be lean because, you know, you're marketing these things, exporting them all around the world. And a lot of them to drive in theaters and cheap dives. And they, and they can't be more than an hour, hour and a half long. Now, some jellos were a little more ambitious than that and, and went up to maybe an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, and the Polizio Teshi ones were. Now, I'm not a Polizio Teshi genre expert. That's Euro crime done in Italy. Um, I've seen a lot of them. They're pretty damn incredible. And uh, like spaghetti westerns, I prefer them to the American versions. Um Lizzie Oteshis have an even more complex structure because you're you're solving a mystery, sure, like you are in Jallo. Uh, but you're also it's a police procedural. So you know, it's really yeah. So some Jallos have police procedural elements. Well, a lot of them do. This one has none of that. And Spanish Jallos in general have their own vibe. But it still has that structure, that aim that I'm talking about. And this one moves beautifully toward it. Maybe it's languid for some people, but I get enveloped in that very languid world. Like, you know, it's almost like static. Not a lot of music in the dramatic scenes. The almost total silence. But then when they do use music, they're, they're pushing things forward. Um, so she's been taking these sleeping pills through the film and then He's like, you, you should stop taking them. And he, she's like, yeah, they're probably not good for me. I usually take two. She takes one and hesitates and decides to just go ahead and take two. And he, he's like, that's cool. She says she wants to sleep a very long time. Well, she does sleep a very long time. No, she doesn't die. Um, but when she wakes up and, and reaches out behind her for uh, Miguel, has been spooning her in her sleep. Um, she realizes he's kind of cold and he doesn't have a heartbeat. And then she turns over and his whole head is bashed in and blood and little pieces of brain. And, you know, it's not really super realistic looking, but it's not unrealistic looking either. It's pretty, pretty nasty. The dark, dark blood they use in this is very, very effective as opposed to like the bright red so many uh, horror directors use during this period. Um, yeah, I like the way Bill Iglesias like is really good with blood and gore. Even though he doesn't do a huge amount of gore, but he does a lot of blood. And uh, she's, you know, of course, freaked out. You know, she's just made love with this guy. She slept for like 15 hours or whatever. And that's when Nuria, Nuria appears. And she's alive. And that's what I was starting to guess because there was, you know, what took me off the most? There was one key line where they're having this kind of philosophical discussion. It's before they they get really, really romantic and have sex. And they, they're talking about the incident, of course, that tied them together. And, he, and he's like, no, I, he's like, I'm not a murderer. And, you know, he's like, uh, I'm trying to think of how he puts it. He's like, I, I'm not a murderer. I, 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 you know, it's just that, and then he stops. And then he kind of says, you know, basically he had to do what he had to do. And he doesn't, you know, he's not a malicious guy. Well, he was actually telling the truth. He, he isn't a murderer at all. And, her, you know, basically, uh, Nuria caught him with another uh, woman who he'd been talking about. He told Lisa all about his, his mistress. Um, he didn't tell her, though, that she was the one who he dropped in the elevator shaft. His wife did the smack on that woman, and that's what we've been seeing, the dead girl isn't his wife, because we haven't even seen his wife. We 
We've just seen that fragment of that face. That that was his girlfriend, not his wife. So she is like forces her cuckolded husband, I mean, well, to dispose of this the slattern that's you know in her bed. She came home early from vacation, and she starts telling Elisa how he's done this numerous times, and she's been spying on the two of them. Except now it's like a turnaround. Instead of killing the other woman and having Miguel be the accomplice, she is going to, she's disposed of the main problem. She's killed Miguel. This won't happen ever again. And then she tells Elisa, hey, you're going to be my accomplice. After all, now you have all this great experience at it. And she gives her like a moment to decide, you know, to agree. I mean, and... They look really deep onto Carmen Sevilla and then the, the woman behind her, Maria, and close up on their face, their eyes, their lips. Again, it's very quick cuts, very cold, very silent, no music. And then she starts to walk, you know, and you see the full body shot, the two shot of them. And she closes the blinds. So is she going to go along with this? Or is she going to turn the tables and kill the woman for revenge? Um, but that's the Eli Iglesia, man. You know, the ending of Glass Ceiling, it's pretty definite what is going to happen. But you don't see it happen. And the, the ominous, the, the ominous kind of looming threat to Carmen in that film, which is like so slow and deliberate, and, and it's just one character holding a gun behind her head, a character she's trusted through the whole movie because she's very paranoid about everything. And that takes place in the room with the woman he's she's confronting, who she believes is behind all this kind of gaslighting of her. And then you realize they're in they're in cahoots and they're in cahoots with her husband too and they're all in on it and it's just you know because she's waiting on him and as soon, and as soon as she looks for and he starts to bring the gun up before Carmen sees the gun the film's over so it's like what a bummer because it gets right up close near her temples so Eloy Iglesias has done it again um, even though he did it 50 years ago. So that's no one heard to scream. Uh, like I said, that wasn't the original name. So there aren't many special features on here. The, the main, the only real special feature on here is Eloy de la Iglesia and the Spanish Jallo, an interview with film scholar, Dr. Andy Willis. So he's British and he talks at length. Um, he's not the most lively speaker, but neither am I. So I mean, you know, what the fuck? And he is very informative. I watched that documentary like three times. Uh, one, one or two, two of those times, I, I had to do other stuff like cook, and I had it on. But I, I, you know, I got the total mosaic formed in my head. He's he's tracking all of the notable developments in Spanish cinema as it go, went towards horror and went towards mystery, and then into an echo of the Italian giallos, but done. In its own style, you know, in their own style. And, you know, of course, he talks about predecessors and, and uh, things that inform them, like The Blood Spattered Bride, uh, which I also have on Blu ray. That's, that's an amazing film. Maybe one day I'll, I'll review that. But, you know, and, and key Spanish horror films from that period, um, even some of the Gothic ones, you know, are glimpsed. And, and then he kind of segues into Eloy de la Iglesia being an outlier you know, working in these genres, using their tropes, but he's got these layers of commentary. I mean, he's very into the class struggle. He's very anti-Franco, not Jess, but Francisco. And he himself was gay, though no one knew it really at the time, the public, I mean, and there's some homoerotic fetishistic imagery. For instance, uh, in No One Heard the Scream, Lisa, they encounter a former, a sometime lover, like a gigolo, uh, of hers who's much younger and that's when they get into the talk about age 
And when they first encounter him, you know, there's still a heat between her and him, but she can't tell him what she's in on, which is disposing of this dead body. When they meet again, she's kind of with Miguel, you know, about to consummate their relationship. They're in like a cocktail bar, a relaxed kind of place with sofas. And we used to have one like that in Charlotte called Tudo Mondo. It was so incredible. And he sees them and he's talking to the bartender who seems pretty definitely gay by his mannerisms and, and body language and the, the kind of, you know, entendres he's throwing at the young guy named Tony. And, and so Tony confronts her again, you know, and she's like, you know, no, you know, I won't be seeing you again. We won't be meeting in London or anywhere else. Because essentially she's a kept woman and then she keeps Tony for her own special sexual needs, but she's letting Tony go. So again, what are her motives? Is it because she really wants to have a relationship with Miguel? You know, uh, he, he ridicules her about Miguel and as though Miguel is a lower class kind of person, even though he lives in this penthouse. He seems to be struggling, whereas Elisa's doing fine. But again, she's kind of um, sponsored, so to speak. Um, so yeah, homoerotic stuff and and a lot of sexual subtext, psychosexual stuff, and uh, those strains are when you know by interweaving like the class elements with the psychosexual elements. He does this in Cannibal Man too. Uh, you know, it's just, um, and, then, and then of course, with Clockwork Terror, he uses sci-fi tropes to weave in a broader social commentary, but it still is, has to do with class consciousness. And, um, you know, Jorge Grau has made several films like this as well. I kind of always relate the two of them together. And thanks to Severin and a couple other country, countries, companies, the two of them are resurging and man it's something to see because Spanish horror has been uh, becoming more and more available since DVDs became widespread and these companies boutique labels began remastering and releasing them so it's not that Spanish horror was unusual but those two filmmakers in particular especially De La Iglesia were underrepresented I mean people knew Cannibal Man Somewhat, and with Grau, everyone knew Living Dead at Manchester Moor, and to a lesser extent, uh, Blood Ceremony. But who who knew um, Code of Hunting? You know, um, <laughs> Coto de Casa, I reviewed that on this channel as well. Uh, I received that, a copy to review from channel patron Tim Tolbert. Um, so now we're seeing the other sides of these guys that I've really been liking for years and that I've written about it. Real magazines you can hold in your hand, and my writing was really naive and silly and much less informed. Uh, and even now, I'm no authority. Um, as soon as I can, I'm going to watch those uh, kinky <laughs> De La Iglesia films on Shudder. I just love his style, and I'm glad to know that there are other people who appreciate him that I know who are knowledgeable, like Kimberly Lindbergh, who wrote the great liner notes. Uh, for the release of Murder in a Blue World, that, that really, when I found out she wrote the liner notes, I didn't learn it from her. I, I, I forgot how I learned it from reading about the release, and then I texted her and congratulated her. Um, this is great. You know, uh, us who've been fans and collectors and cinephiles and, you know, how, whatever you want to call us geeks that, that have, you know, been on this journey. Some of us, you know, since the early 80s, some like myself since the early 90s, and some a little bit later. But what we've all been pushing toward is having access to all this material, seeing what it's really about, judging for ourselves these movies that were censored and, and attacked and maligned uh, and made unavailable in various countries. And, uh, and finally getting seeing them in pristine prints and in deluxe editions that you know you think would be reserved for and usually is reserved for like gone with the wind or the godfather or the wizard of oz you know when you're seeing these giant box set releases you know like shawscope i mean that that's that's asian 
maybe it's off field of this, but not exactly because again, that's a cult too. There was European trash cinema, Asian trash cinema, and then Asian cult cinema, and the same guys, Tom Weiser and Craig Ledbetter, and then later Robert Monell, who I know, um, worked on that stuff. And that's what I'm saying. We were all in on it. My friend, my good friend Sean Lee Levin got into it later. He's a bit younger than me. But his father, Stephen Levin, has been a collector and, and viewer and a collector of the zines that gave the valuable information, what little you could glean on these films all the way back to the 80s. So it's gratifying to see a company like Severin taking off. No, I'm not paid by Severin. I'm not employed. But man, God's bless them, man. I just never thought, I was sitting in my friend Michael's uh, den downstairs, and he got this new bootleg from Craig Ledbetter, and he, they would talk on the phone a lot, and he, Craig did a European trash cinema. I said, yeah, I got some new tapes from Craig, man. Here's one no one heard the scream. It's another one of these Spanish ones by this Eloy de la Iglesia, you know, and you know, he remarked on his name Eloy because there was a, a great kraut rock band called Eloy that, that he was a huge fan of. I, I had never heard Eloy. Now I'm a huge fan many years later for sure. Um, I named one of my major characters Eloy. Um, and we watched this together. And wow, it was cool. It was refreshing. It was really, uh, he really helped reawaken my um, love for cinema to another level. I mean, I was already on that journey. I had been since like 1992 in vain. And uh, him and Bill White, my great friend Bill White and my great friend Tim McLean, the three of them were older than me and had seen more stuff, collected more stuff, experienced more cinema. And uh, I, I kind of let them guide me, you know, and I hope I'm able to guide people like Sean and my friend Tim Tolbert, who are a bit younger than, than I am, who are on this same journey. So anyway, I have talked enough. Uh, I will see you soon. Uh, there's going to be some blue reviews. There's going to be some videos that aren't blue reviews uh, that I, I hope you might enjoy anyway. Um, all of that's coming in the next week. Unless, you know, more crises ensue, but we shall see. Love you guys. Thanks Thanks for watching. I'm not, see, I still never hit the right button. That's <laughs> hilarious. Take care.